Hello, reading friend. Thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. This book was originally published back in 1924, and I read an Every Man's Library edition, uh, translated from the original German by John E. Woods. And I just love this edition. It's just such a a wonderful edition. See, if you read it, it just stays right open, even though it's kind of a big chunker of a book, 853 pages. It also has this cool kind of bookmark ribbon, which my cat actually usually thought was a toy, and so she frayed the end of it. She would come up and ch -ch -ch <laughs> bat it. Um, but yeah, it's just, this is such a great edition. And I read this Every Man's Edition of um, Every Man's Library's Every Man's Library edition of Joseph and His Brothers as well. Highly recommend this edition. So, The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. I wanted to read this because um, a few years ago I read Joseph and His Brothers by Thomas Mann, which I loved. I've read um, Death in Venice and Seven Other Stories, a collection of short stories by Thomas Mann, which I also loved. And, you know, this book was also mentioned in Norwegian Wood, which I chatted a while back. So, um, yeah, it seemed like that this book was kind of calling my name to get read. It was kind of a chunker, so it was a significant time investment, but well worth it because, you know, nobody really can write like Thomas Mann. Just really, uh, really a literary artist at the top of his game here. So, um, what it's about is set in a sanatorium in Switzerland in the years prior to World War I. And our main character's name is Hans Castorp. And he goes up to this sanatorium to visit his cousin, whose name is Joachim Zimson. So Joachim is, um, they're around the same age. They're in their early, I think, early-ish 20s at the time the book opens. And Joachim is um, wanting to a career in the military. So, but he has these lung issues. So he's been sent to this sanatorium to heal. And so his cousin, Hans, is um, about to start an apprenticeship, I think, um, or a career anyway, in really engineering. And um, he, before, but before he sets out on that path, he decided to go for this, what was going to be a three-week visit to his cousin, to see his cousin at the sanatorium. Well, so he winds up staying quite a bit longer because the thing that goes on at this sanatorium, what goes on at this sanatorium is basically when you get there, you find out, you might not have realized it, right? But you find out you have some kind of illness. And that is a recurring theme throughout really the whole book where these groups of people, um, you know, this collection of people in this sanatorium, the characters kind of come and go, but they all have various complaints, mostly lung type complaints. Um, and they wind up staying months or even years in some cases. And then sometimes, you know, they pass away. So our main two characters, at least through most of the book, are Hans and his cousin Joachim. They're sort of pals. Uh, they, they stay in rooms right next to each other. As I mentioned, Hans sort of gets drawn into this world. You know, this is sort of like a magic world in the sense that time really loses its sense of meaning. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here in a bit. Because the time that, as it's measured in the sanatorium is different than the time in what they call the flatlands, you know, the, 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 the outside world. So time moves in a different, a different pace in this sanatorium. It's very uh, routine, so it's the same routine. Time kind of moves in a circle uh, here, um, and so there's not a lot of action, which is kind of another kind of key theme that I had in the book is like action in 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 life versus passivity and passivity in life. So I'll talk more about that too here in a bit. So other other main characters. So um, there's a lot of really side characters, but other sort of main characters is one of them is Settembrini. He is an Italian. 
um, older man who um, really takes uh, Hans and his cousin under his wing really as to, to sort of instruct them in the ways of life and he reflects a humanist type of philosophy. He has a sort of disdain for the culture that's at the sanatorium and often criticizes it. But eventually he um, sort of becomes a dual in, a, in sort of a duality with another character whose name is Naphtha. Naphtha uh, started out as a Jewish person, but who converted to the Jesuit order um, and then ended up with, with, you know, a lung issue and so wound up in this sort of resort town or this sort of uh, sanatorium town. He's not actually in the sanatorium itself, but in the village that's associated with the sanatorium. He and Setembrini ultimately share... Um, they don't share a room, but they, they live in a boarding house uh, or they share rooms, a rooming space uh, together. And they're sort of at these sort of odds all the time. They argue all the time. They literally argue all the time. It's actually pretty funny in a lot of cases, but it does get serious in some points in the book. But Naphtha represents a different sort of world order, sort of an anti-humanist world order sort of more revolutionary, more authoritarian, really more, so whereas Cetabrini represents sort of the rational, enlightenment, humanistic uh, world of sort of reason and philosophy, um, Naphtha represents sort of the opposite of that, which would be more like authoritarianism, more religious, uh, you know, conservative, as far as authority coming from an, an upper, a, a, a source higher than human, humanity, um, you know, and so as Cetabrini, the ultimate, sort of the ultimate um, authority would be humans themselves, whereas in Naphtha's view, it would be, you know, God or basically religion, actually, like the church, like organized, um, that sort of structure. So these two argue all the time, and they, they really vie for the attention and to make points with the younger um, uh, Hans and Joachim to try to convert them over to their worldview. Then there's some couple of other sorts of, of things going on in the main characters. One is Claud Claudia Chauche. So she is... Um, a woman that's at the sanatorium that Hans becomes intrigued with. Hans, in his earlier life, had had a really, uh, I guess his first love or his first sort of crush was this boy. And when he was in school, when he was younger, that he had a crush on and was, was very hesitant to talk to or whatever, but ultimately borrowed a pencil from. And this borrowing of the pencil from this boy was sort of the highlight of his life at that point. Well, Claudia actually looks like this boy and reminds Hans of this boy, and he develops a similar type crush on her, and actually ultimately does also borrow a pencil from her eventually. She actually leaves the sanatorium at one point, but then she returns with a man. The man's name is Mynheer Peppercorn, and he is a Dutch um, businessman who has developed a tropical disease and um, is at the sanatorium, and he sort of represents this worldview of pleasure-seeking, really like uh, eat, drink, and be merry type of person, right? You know, an overindulgence, actually, um, is, his, is his philosophy. So just some thoughts and impressions, and I mentioned already illness and death, and so illness and death, I think, portray it's portrayed a lot in the in the book. Hans spends a lot of time thinking about this and studying it. Even he winds up buying some medical books just so that he can learn more about disease. But you know, one good way to illustrate life, health, and life is to study and reflect on illness and death. And so that theme runs throughout the book. And then the other one is time. It's talking about how time can be different. It can be viewed differently. And as I mentioned, time is, runs differently at the sanatorium than it does in the flatlands, you know, the outside. And the quote says, We know full well that the insertion of new habits or the changing of old ones is the only way to preserve life, to renew our sense of time, and thereby renew our sense of life itself. Time is life itself. 
Um, I think that's such a cool quote. He does, eventually in this book, it's also talked about how music, time is music. So music, if di music didn't express time, it would just be one chord at the very beginning and there would be nothing else. But music, you know, flows through time. He talks about how painting, painting is a moment in time, captured in time. Time has stopped in a painting, right? Um, and then also in um, narrative, like in literature, where the time needs to flow a certain way for the story to make sense to the reader. So time is movement. Time is life. Then action and passivity, um, duty to self versus duty to society. So this is illustrated a lot with Hans and his cousin. So Joachim wants nothing more than to get well and leave the sanatorium. However, Hans is the opposite. He actually becomes more passive and has no real desire to return to the flatlands. Han, uh, jo Joachim just really wants to return and be, in, be a soldier. Um, has this sense of duty, you know, duty to, to, to society uh, that he needs to fulfill as a soldier. Hans, you know, really doesn't, doesn't express this, but this sort of theme kind of runs through the book as well. Um, all right, finally, yeah, another thing was the number seven. The number seven recurs throughout this book. Settembrini has the seven in Italian is in his name. Um, seven years, the book takes place over the course of seven years. There are seven tables in the... Um, in the sanitarium that the, sort of develop their own little societies, which table you're setting at for the meals in, this, in the sanitarium. And um, before the, the novel's over, um, Hans has actually moved through all seven tables. So it's sort of like a cyclical calendar, right? A calendar running in a circle. Um, so I thought that that symbolism of the seven was really cool. Hans lived, is in, his room is uh, 34, I think which is three plus four is seven, and Joachim's room is 28, which is a multiple of seven. Um, so seven re reappears throughout the novel, which is very cool. There's a quote here that I think is really cool about um, handwriting, how handwriting can lead to style. Style leads to how you think, and think thinking how you think leads to what you do. And the quote is... Um, Writing beautifully was almost synonymous with thinking beautifully, and from there it was not far to acting beautifully. I think that's so cool. So if you write what if you write beautifully, that's going to lead you to think beautifully, and if you think beautifully, that's going to cause you to act beautifully. I thought that was so cool. Um, you know, I just loved this book so much. Um, Thomas Mann just never disappoints. It's just beautiful, beautiful writing. You know, I'm not a, a literary scholar. A lot more could be said about this. I think probably university classes are taught on this book. Um, but just sort of, those were my sort of my key uh, thoughts and impressions about after reading this book. Um, so I'll leave the chat there. My next chat is going to be The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. This is book one of the Wheel of Time series. I'm loving this. So a chat on this will be coming up fairly soon. Take care. Bye.